You're listening to Real Crime, the Movie Sleuth Podcast. Welcome. Yeah, Troma Dance 2019. 19. Detroit. You've been here before, right? No, it's no? my first time here. Okay, I thought you came before. No. No? So what do you think so far? <sighs> Pretty awesome. I mean, all of. sorts of different things. I didn't really know what to expect. I mean, you know, I've seen trauma films, obviously, and I mean, I guess it's kind of a, they're a mixed bag themselves. It's like, all yeah. you can really expect, I guess, is to be offended. See, I remember... Um, in the 90s, you know, I was in high school. I'm aging myself right now. Um, 1990, 1991, going to the video store mm-hmm. and renting movies from Troma, like Surf Nazis Must Die, the original Toxie movies. Mm-hmm. Those movies are fucking crazy. Yes. They're absolutely fucking crazy. Yeah. But still, in our wheelhouse. Totally. And for me, it was Tromeo and Juliet was the first one I saw. And I saw that at the, at the rental and I didn't even know what trauma was, and I didn't understand why it was called Tromeo. But <laughs> I just kept I just kept looking at the box and looking at the back and being like, I gotta fucking see this. And I watched it, and it is it is what, still one of my favorite movies of all time. Is it? Yeah. That one is a trip. Yeah, for sure, sure is. Yeah, for sure. And Lemmy narrates it, so you can't go wrong with that one. <laughs> you can never go wrong with no, that. No, that was a real. I think that was a really good introduction for me into trauma. Yeah, yeah. So we're here today. This thing goes on all day long. What time did this start at? Like 2 o'clock? 1? One. One? Mm-hmm. And it goes till 2 in the morning. Mm-hmm. So you're getting a full day of entertainment. There's live bands, experimental bands, and tons and tons of movies, mm-hmm. which we watch too. Yes, and I was, today. Just, I was just checking out a little bit of the feature they have going on right now, which um, I don't have the program in front of me, so I can't, I don't remember what the title is, but it's pretty funny about uh, <clears throat> these people trying to crowdsource a movie but they can't get the money so they're doing a heist to try to raise money for it and having made some independent films myself it's like it's pretty relatable (laughs) what they're going through and how you feel about that it's basically something you'd have to do to fund a movie these days anyways oh yeah totally talking about funding movies this last week i went to the local screening of the peanut butter falcon Mm -hmm. which was really interesting it's a new movie that stars shia labeouf the producer Tim Zajaros was there in person. He personally funded the movie himself. It was pretty amazing. He lived in Michigan, was some kind of financial consultant. We're going to be posting an interview with this guy at some point this week, next week. Mm-hmm. Um, I met with him in uh, Birmingham at the Townsend the other day. But anyways, he was a financial consultant here and decided to move out to LA and uh, went out there and basically started his own production company and made so much money working on films for Netflix that he ended up self-funding this entire movie. That's really cool, that's so cool. Millions and millions of dollars he spent out of pocket to film this new movie with Shia LaBeouf. That's the dream, man. It is, it's really, really cool that somebody could actually do that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we always have to mention our sponsors, the Flint Institute of Arts. Yes. A wonderful, wonderful place. Cheers. And uh, Sellermans, unfortunately, died. Yeah. I never They're got to gone. go there. I'm so bummed out about that. You guys would have loved it. Really cool venue. Very independent feel. They had great mead there. Um, unfortunately, we lost them as a sponsor because they closed their doors. Yeah. And then, of course, Matador Martial Arts in St. Clair Shores. Got to hit him up. Yep. Rudy's cool. Have you talked to Rudy No, yet? I haven't. Rudy's a really nice guy. You should friend him on Facebook. I will. Um, very interesting person because he's into the same stuff as us. Mm-hmm. He owned that toy shop on Harper for a while. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. The Mall of Justice. Mm-hmm. Cool spin on the Hall of Justice. So, yeah, uh, he's one of our sponsors now. And then, of course, ProjectorScreen.com. So nice. We love all you guys. You give us money to keep this thing going, and we appreciate that. Yes. So, what do you want to talk about today? Um, Well, I wasn't planning on this, but I watched this amazing film yesterday on Amazon Prime. It was a film called Vendetta, 
And uh, essentially it's about a woman who gets herself arrested to exact revenge on some inmates who killed her sister who was in prison. And um, it's kind of like Glow. Oh, I love that show. Like the movie. Like it, it's just just a there's a never ending showcase of like eighties makeup, eighties hair, big earrings, and just fight scenes. Yeah. And there's some just really I mean great insults. Uh, the woman who plays Max Mom and It's Always Sunny is like the is the villain in this movie, and she's just wearing like leather pants and a black a shirt, like wife beater shirt, and she's just <laughs> badass, and she calls someone a twat face in it. It's it's just great insults, great hairdos, great outfits, great acts of violence, and I just highly recommend it. Yeah, just a lot of good indie stuff lately. Well, this one is from '86. Oh, it's, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So this one is I don't so know. You're, if, Digging kind of deep on that one. Yeah, and I've been finding out like a lot of stuff like this on on Amazon Prime. I don't know if they're made for TV movies or just movies that were like, well, this one wasn't on TV, but um, you know, just these movies that kind of seem to just for some reason. I, I I mean, I'm I was a child at that point, so they passed me by. They didn't get a DVD, Blu-ray, Blu-ray Ray release. They weren't on cable when I was a kid, so I they passed me by. But I'm seeing them now and. It was that and the Wraith was the other one that I checked out on Prime, and uh, we talked about the yeah, Wraith for a while. Yeah, I mentioned that one because that was like one probably like when I watched that movie, instant favorite movie of mine. Now that's with Charlie Sheen, correct? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I've not seen that probably since the eighties. Like that was yeah. all around that time that um, the Legend of Billy Jean uh-huh. was out. Films like that. Yeah. Very very eighties. You should. I think you should rewatch that one. Yeah. I think it. I mean, it's got a very heavy '80s aesthetic, like to the point where it's almost like, like I said, like it feels like you're watching Glow or like Stranger Things because it's like, it's so heavy in the '80s aesthetic that it's almost like you went back and like redid it, and it's like just everything we love and we remember about the '80s. It's got a really cool soundtrack, though. What the Wraith? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. That had like. It had Ozzy songs in it, a lot of like national big rock acts. It was cool. Both, yeah. I'm excited to go into like more of these uh, movies I, that passed me by in the 80s on Prime. Well, and like this 80s aesthetic is really the big thing right now. Yeah, I know. Ever since Stranger way. Things hit, it's like everything now is, well, I shouldn't say everything, mm-hmm. but that whole 80s aesthetic yeah. is really. And hitting hard. Oh my god! And in, ve- in Vendetta, like this woman's like in court, and she's got on blue eyeshadow. No, she's got sorry, pink eyeshadow, blue eye, blue eyeliner, and purple mascara. And it's like she looks like an Easter egg. It's it's, it's amazing. <laughs> she's all painted up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Legend of Billie Jean. I think that's one of my. No, I've never did, seen that one. Did you ever see that one? Have you guys ever seen this movie? So basically, this movie is about, it's Christian Slater's sister, Helen Slater. She played Supergirl in the tripped yeah. out Supergirl movie in the 80s. Um, she's just, you know, kind of, I don't want to say the term white trash, but just kind of, you know, very poor, you know, mm-hmm. live in a mobile home, the whole deal. Everybody takes advantage of them. They have no money. Christian Slater is in the movie. They mm-hmm. play brother and mm-hmm. sister. But the brother gets in some trouble and Billie Jean tries to save him and then the old man that runs the store where he got in trouble at decides to try and rape her and she beats the shit out of the guy Mm -hmm. and then basically they hold the store at gunpoint. Then the entire movie is basically them like rebelling Mm -hmm. against the system. Mm -hmm. It's very, very 80s but also really kind of fits with the things we see going on now too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very progressive female Empowerment. You know, I miss movies like that. I feel like they don't really make them like that anymore. I don't don't know. It's like, I I watched Vendetta, and it's like, you don't, even back then, I guess you didn't really see a movie that was quite like that. I mean, it's it's got the ladies in it, and there's there's some nudity in it, but I mean, I don't feel like that was like the exact point of the movie, is to just ogle the ladies. They're there if you like them and you want to see them. Yeah. But, you know, it was really about this, you know, woman trying to get her revenge. It's really cool. 
I like revenge flicks. Too. I do too. I revenge do too. flicks are some of my favorite movies. I think yeah, I'm, I'm probably in agreement with you on that. And really, the the female vengeance flicks. Yeah. Some of them are really hard to watch. Like yeah. I spit on your grave. I've never seen that one. That's one I've wanted to see, but I've never seen. My favorite is um, Ms. 45. Oh yeah. The, you know, the only thing I don't like about the movies, obviously, is all the rape. Mm-hmm. Because it's really, it's so hard to watch. And a lot of it is based off women just being victims mm-hmm. and then having to go out and kill men. Mm-hmm. Like, the victimhood of it. So, yeah. You know what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, I Spit on Your Grave. Have you guys seen that one? Yeah. The original? Yes. Have you seen the remake? I have not. The remake is almost just as good as the original. Wow, it's that's a, rare. It's a complete modern update of it, and it's really good. The kills are way more brutal, though. Interesting. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Because they couldn't just leave it. It had to be super ultra-violent. Of course. But yeah, they ended up making three of those. Of they the made, remakes? Yeah, they made the remake, and then they made oh. a sequel that was about a different girl, and then they made oh. a second sequel, which brought the girl from the first... Re- remake back. And when were these from? Like the past decade like, or older? Yeah, the last like six to seven years. And then they just made a direct sequel to I Spit on Your Grave with Camille Keaton from yeah. the original back. I've I heard hear about it's terrible. That. I heard it's absolutely terrible. But that's one from when I even, from, like, I used to work at Suncoast back in the like late 90s, early 2000s. And um, the assistant manager was like, what, like my first film teacher and she would be like have you seen that she just laid tapes out on the thing have you seen this you got to and that was one of them she told me to see it that was probably the one of the only ones that she told me to see I haven't seen yet yeah it's it's definitely a hard watch I've got it yeah you well, should the, borrow the it the thing is and, and, and this is like there was a couple there, there was a hard scene at the beginning of Vendetta and there's you know a few hard scenes at the beginning of Miss 45 but I mean and I don't like to see that kind of stuff I watch all sorts of messed up movies, but like that's you know any any type of like sexual assault really kind of is like the limit where I'm kind of like uh, I don't know if I like this, but I feel like with a revenge movie you need to have that feeling for the rest of the movie. Like I don't mind having that feeling if there's a payoff. Well, yeah, it's kind of like you got to go down that dark corridor to kind of have the yeah. empowerment struggle Well, it's like, make me place. feel all this hate and rage so I can feel good about watching all the murder I'm yeah. going to watch. Yeah, yeah, You know? No matter what, it's still hard to watch, though. It is. It you is. Know. But there is, a, there is something that's like, even though it's hard to watch and you don't like it, it's like, it puts you in a, like, a weird, almost, like, it's, an, it's a good feeling because it's like, you have control over it. It's you can stop it if you want. It's like it's sublime feeling of, I guess, catharsis. You know. Yeah, I would say that's a good term for it. Yeah, and I mean we talked about this before on our on our show. The the like, why do you want to watch all this like really you know intense stuff like fucked up stuff happening? Like what's going on with you? You know, like what is it about? You know. There's something satisfactory about it. I yeah. don't know what. Yeah. It's almost like drugs in a way. Yeah. Like you get those endorphins going when the bad stuff is happening. Mm-hmm. And then you have that sense of satisfaction when the yeah. woman, like, kills everything in sight. Yeah. Very violently, too. And that's, like, you <laughs> know how I feel sometimes when you watch, like, someone in, a, you know, a movie being, like, it's just such a fucking scumbag, you know? And you're, like... All right, man. I hope this filmmaker gets gives this guy what he's got coming to him. Then I can really yeah. like this yeah. movie. Yeah. Um, what are some other movies you've watched lately? Um, I watched Prom Night for the first time with Jamie Lee Curtis, and that wow. was. I did not like that one. Yeah, it's not. It's like one of those '80s slasher films, but it doesn't really live up to. No. It's. Yeah, everybody's oh, it's one of the best ever. No, it's not. And it's sad because Jamie Lee has got a lot of charisma. She's, you know, like, she, she's great in it, and, but she's got nothing to work with. It's not a Halloween. It's not a Friday the 13th. Right, yeah. It's like they just, I think they just got her because she was, you know. She was the it thing right. at the time. And she, like, looks great. She's, her character's, like, really likable. Um, but my biggest complaint with that movie is, like, most of it's, like, a disco number. Is, is a disco number. 
Yeah. And it was like, I like disco, <laughs> but I like felt like I did it after I watched yeah, it. I'm done with the disco. Yeah, I was like, don't, I can't do disco this. Disco's dead. Yeah. Yeah. But I heard 2 is very different, and that's kind of the one to watch. Oh, yeah, it's Prom Night 2, Hello, Mary Lou, yeah. I think. Yeah, it's a completely different story about someone getting revenge from something that happened in the 50s. Yeah. So. Well, see, I believe that Prom Night 2 came out after Christine. Mm-hmm. And they kind of tried to go for some of the thematic elements of Christine. Yeah. Where they, you know, Christine, even though it takes place in the 80s, there's a lot of 50s nostalgia yeah. in the movie. I think that's kind of what they were going for yeah. with that. Trying to kind of follow that trail a bit. Yeah, that's on my to-watch list. That'll be one of the next ones I watch, for sure. We could just talk about horror all day long. Oh, I know. We? Yeah, we totally could. I mean, that's... I like other movies, other types of movies, but it seems like I'm always... We're all into horror. Everybody. I just, like, I don't know. I, I'm more inclined to put on a horror movie. Well, it's funny. We've got 30 people that write for the site now, mm -hmm. and I would say 27 of us are all... Into horror, heavily, yeah. heavily into and horror. And if not horror, like sci-fi. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I probably lean more towards sci-fi, but I love the horror stuff too. Mm -hmm. And then sci-fi horror. And in more horror this week, this is really strange, and I don't know if I agree with this or not. But Robert England once again came out and said he wants to play Freddy Krueger one more time. Mm -hmm. But if he can't get to play Freddy Krueger in time, he wants Kevin Bacon. <laughs> to take over is Freddy Krueger. I would watch that. I don't know. I would watch that, too. I kind of want Kevin Bacon to do it instead. Just I to see what he's going to do. Yeah. I always thought Kevin Bacon would actually be a really good Dirty Harry, also. Okay, yeah. He has that same, like, grizzled look as Clint Eastwood. Especially now that he's getting a little bit older. He's got Not that I really think there's a wide look. He can kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know if we need another Nightmare on Elm Street. Haven't they kind of just... Milked it. I mean, we were just talking about that at a friend's house. Uh, well, there's like ten of those movies, including the remake. At this point, I think there's seven of them, right? Seven or eight of them, and then, and then the remake, and then the remake, and then the Freddy vs. Jason. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's nine, nine or ten. We counted. Yeah, nine or ten, yeah. something like that. Yeah. I mean, they're all there. I mean, first that was another thing. We I just rewatched the Nightmare on a Nightmare on Elm Street. That movie holds up. That'll, that movie will never get old to me. Never be bad. It's always good. And I'm um, <clears throat> going to kind of go through the list of those now next, too. Yeah, it's kind of hard with the classics. What? To, to keep going back to the well. Yeah. You know, like Nightmare on Elm Street. We're going to keep going back to that. We're yeah. going to keep going back to it. And it's you get to that point where it's leave well enough alone. We don't need the backstory. Well, yeah, I mean that's what that's what I'm saying. It's like we can go back and watch that original. That's still a good movie. It's a great, still movie. good, and it's like you know, all the rest of them have their merits too, in my opinion. I, I mean, two is not my favorite, but um, I'm looking forward to rewatching that one. Gonna, you know, I think three was the one where they're at the. Uh, Dream Warriors is three. That's the one where they're at the like mental institution. Yeah. That one's really good. I really like that That's one. That's the one that everybody loves the most. Yeah. Because I think with that one, everybody has a character they can relate to. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of different characters. Freddy's in it a lot. He's in it a lot more than he is in one and in two. There's a lot more cool dream sequences and kills. It's, it's kind of, I think, that's kind of like the quintessential Freddy movie. History. Yeah, that's when he... Yeah. The bad thing about 3 is that's when he kind of went off the deep end into being humor. Yeah. I it, like that, though, about it. I know. It gave him a little bit of charisma. But he is a lot creepier in 1. Oh, yeah. He's got his humor really edge to it, the way he is, but it's still, like, he's scary as shit in that movie. Yeah. Number 1 is scary. Yeah. Number 2... Have you guys all seen Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge? That's the homoerotic one yeah. that everybody yes. always refers to. It's the truth, yeah. um, which is fine. It's totally fine. Yeah, it's it's interesting story, and I think it's cool, and, I, and I'm happy that you know that story is like out there and everything. That honestly, the thing I don't like about it the most is the fact that it doesn't really seem like Freddy's in it that much. 
and he doesn't really seem so much like it's a Nightmare on Elm Street movie until I guess the end. Yeah, he shows up from what I'm. It's been a minute since I've seen this one. The thing but. I don't like about Nightmare on Elm Street too is that when they get to Freddy's lair, basically at the end of mm-hmm, the movie, mm-hmm. like the demon dogs mm-hmm. and all that shit. It's like, where did this come from all of a sudden? Yeah, we went from Freddy and now it's kind of sidestepping into <sighs> some other horror territory. It yeah. just did not seem like a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Yeah, for a lot of it. Yeah, I but agree. Still fun. Still fun. Yeah, there are some good parts to it. Um, better than probably a lot of entries in different horror franchises. So, yeah, and I haven't seen it in a long time. It's it's one of, it's something I want really want to rewatch and see if I'm go through still all of don't them. like you know. When we did our Nightmare on Elm Street podcast, like two years ago, uh-huh. like I literally sat down and watched all of them in yeah. like a day and a half. And when you watch them that close together, you can really tell. Like mm-hmm. where they were like, oh, we gotta push this shit out as fast as we can. Yeah, you can't. We tell. gotta make that money. You can tell because I tell I could tell when we did the child's play episode. I watched them all. Yeah. Like that, and you could see. I think it was three. Yeah, three. It was like they, I was looking at the dates, and it was like a few months after two. You could really tell that one was not good. It's funny. I've told the story before, maybe on the show, but when I was a kid. My aunt had seen Nightmare on Elm Street in the theaters Mm -hmm. and told me about it. And, of course, my mom was like, no, you're not seeing that. It's too violent. It's this, it's that. Well, soon after, you know, probably six or seven months later, it comes out on VHS tape. Mm -hmm. There I go aging myself again. (laughs) Uh, There was a video store by our house, and they had one copy on videotape. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't just go rent it. You had to put a reservation on it you couldn't just go get it and you go down the list you go in there every day or call they're like hey where am i on the list you know oh you've got another week so it's yours (laughs) so before blockbuster days and they had like 50 copies at least of every movie yeah this was like video house east you know it was just some little mom and pop shop but my dad was like yeah you can see that movie and my mom's like you can't see that movie (laughs) so my dad you know i mean we reserved the videotape and we go and pick it up, and I think I'm in, like, seventh grade or something like that at the time. And I take it home, and, I mean, it's, like, daylight outside still. Mm-hmm. And I, like, pop this videotape in in the family room, and my mom's like, what the hell are you watching? And I'm like, Nightmare <laughs> on Elm Street. And she's like, I said I didn't want you to watch this. I'm like, well, Dad said I could. <laughs> and so, you know, that argument ensued. You know, I told you no. Mm-hmm. He said blah, 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 blah. You know, Mom and Dad stuff, whatever. They were fine, but yeah, so I saw this movie for the first time on videotape, like, in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. Like, worst way you can watch that movie. Yeah. You know, like, you need the lights off, but, so my dad and me, you know, struck up this thing where then we saw all the Nightmare on Elm Street movies together. Yeah. We saw all the Alien movies together in the theater, too. Not the first one, because I was too too young for that, but um, starting with Aliens, we saw them all in the theater together, but I'll never forget Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. We went and saw it. I don't know if you'd even remember this theater, but Beacon East. I remember that theater, yeah. Yeah, Beacon East on 8 Mile and Kelly. And, you know, it was the long, narrow theaters with the vinyl seats and, you know, the screen up high. And, you know, you're looking up at the screen. And, you know, there's probably 600 seats in this place. Mm -hmm. I mean, because they used to just pack it in. Mm -hmm. Fuck the fire marshal. We don't care. We're packing as many people (laughs) in there as we can get. And... The neighborhood was not the best, mm-hmm. and my, that was the only place that was showing it at midnight. So we went, and you know, be, you couldn't buy tickets online, you couldn't buy tickets over the phone. It was go and wait, buy your tickets, and then wait in line yep. outside the building so you could get a decent seat. Mm-hmm. So my dad was a bodybuilder, okay? Mm-hmm. So my dad was huge, like big guy. When my dad came back from Vietnam, he got into two things. My dad was like, Rambo, basically. My dad was a bodybuilder, and he was into archery. Okay, my dad liked to kill. Oh man, your dad was a badass. Yeah, my dad, and my dad is still into archery. He actually is a professional sportsman now. My dad, at seventy-three years old, is sponsored by like big archery companies like Matthews and shit. He's in Pope and Young record book like five different times. Like he's into this. My dad 
sadly knows n knew Ted Nugent for a little while. Now sadly. he does not like Ted Nugent very Aww. much because my dad, <laughs> even though my dad's a badass, he's a total Democrat. So he's not a Nugent. Know, yeah, <laughs> uh, not a fan of Nugent. I actually met met Fred Bear when I was like, I think seven really? years old. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so there was this long history of all that. Anyways, so my dad is this big motherfucker. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he takes us to see Dream Warriors opening night, midnight, basically in the ghetto. I mean, that neighborhood was terrible at the time. And uh, in the middle of the movie, a fight breaks out. Damn. Like, literal, all-out brawl. These dudes are going at it in the middle of the theater. And, like, I'm like, oh, shit, what's going to happen? And my dad totally does the action star thing. He, like, stands <laughs> up, and he's like, stay behind me. And me and my buddy Bill were just like, look, yeah, dude. This is so funny. <laughs> so, so I will never forget that. Nightmare on Elm Street That's 3. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was hilarious. So, he's still not a little guy, but, you know, he's in his 70s now, so he doesn't do all that physical stuff. But that's, like, one of those movie things, like, that you'll remember when you're 80 years old. Like, I remember my dad was ready to kill some motherfuckers at Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah. So, that's my good story for the day. Yeah, I can't tap that. My dad's not... Uh... <laughs> I don't have any cool movie stories about no, my dad. No. Just, just get like getting you know lost yeah. on the way to a camping trip, and you know, that's about it. <laughs> getting my lost. dad's the opposite of that. Sadly, sorry, dad. <laughs> He's like, this sucks. We're lost. We're going home now. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, these horror franchises, though. Like another one that's totally gone off the rails is uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, I like that's one. I've been kind of on this kick since we did the uh, Child's Place uh, episode. I want to kind of rewatch all the franchises that I that I you know I like, but I also want to kind of get into ones that like maybe passed me by or I've seen movies here and there, you know, and kind of liked, but never really like sat down and like got into the whole mythology of everything. And I think Tessa's Chainsaw Massacre is probably one of those franchises that like okay i've seen the original I've seen the remake i've seen like i don't know which one one of the one of the sequels like maybe four and then i've seen the next generation is that what it was called the next with, generation with renee zellweger and in matthew mcconaughey yeah and did you guys know there's a texas chainsaw massacre movie with matthew mcconaughey and renee zellweger did you know that yeah <laughs> did you see this one yeah, you have. Watch it with me. We owned it. Yeah. It's Yeah, we love that one. It's like total camp. Yes. Matthew McConaughey is off the rails to this entire and movie. It's Insane. a little it's a little un PC, I guess, these days, because it's about a like like a, a trans person or something. Well Leatherface like is transsexual. A cross dresser. Yeah. It's a little more like Yeah. A little more transgressive than you know, yeah. just skinning people and wearing their faces, which yeah. I don't know that was a how fun much one. more transgressive you get than that. It's a but. fun one. But yeah, I definitely want, I want to go through, rewatch the first one and just, you know, kind of watch the next one, next one, next one, all within a couple, you know, a few days of each other. So I like to see the, like, how it changes, what yeah. they do, like how the franchise evolves because it's like with these franchises you always have the first one and what it turns into and what people think of it as is never quite what that no. first movie is they never really quite align yeah so it's it's just fascinating to me well with texas chainsaw it all changed so much because the first one was straight slasher terrifying horror mm -hmm. that kind of started the whole slasher craze for yeah. the most part. It mm -hmm. was one of the originators one of, the of that ones. entire thing. You know, before Friday the 13th or Halloween or any of those. Super gritty movie, too. Oh, it's yeah. so gritty. That color washing that yeah. they do in that movie, it, it's it yellow. It makes you feel more, like, it, it just adds something to the, like, creepiness of you it. You need a shower. The horror of it, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, okay, I gotta go wash it's off like this you dust. feel like you got, like, dirt all over yeah. you. Yeah. So, yeah, those went from the original being, like, straight slasher you know, cannibalism flick mm -hmm. to Tex Chainsaw 2, which is, like, dark mm -hmm. comedy, basically. 
with Dennis Hopper. I think that might... I can't remember. I used to have one on VHS, and I couldn't remember if it was that one or another one. It's the one that basically ripped off the Breakfast Club poster for its promo poster. I think that was the one And that had I the had whole had family, then. like, laying around, like, the people from the Breakfast Club. Yeah. Do you remember which one I had on VHS? When I... Yeah, I, I, I can't remember at all. I liked it. <laughs> I'm like, that's why I want to rewatch him. You think it was two? Yeah, that's why I want to rewatch him. Because it's like, god damn, I watched so many movies. It's like, once a decade goes by, and I'm like, wait, yeah. I liked that movie. And it's like, I got to rewatch it. Yeah. You know, if I haven't watched it since then. So, yeah, those went from that to three, which was Leatherface, which was completely different. Again, like they were living in a house in a forest. Mm-hmm. Which was really weird, mm-hmm. and then uh, I can't remember what was for the next generation. Yeah. Okay, that's why I was thinking it was four. So the one I had was two then that I liked. Okay. Yeah, the next generation I like watched that on HBO, like when we still had cable mm-hmm. TV, when people still had cable TV. <laughs> but yeah, I remember watching that thing like one one in the morning on HBO, being like, "What the? What is this?" That's the best when you catch when you used to catch yeah. movies like. Like it's just through the channel that you wouldn't and you're expect. Like, it's just starting, and you see something yeah. like fucked up, and you're like, "Wait, what's this?" Yeah, and then after that, we got the remake, mm-hmm. which wasn't bad. I didn't think. I thought Jessica Biel was awesome. Yeah. In that movie, that Texas Chainsaw film was absolutely terrifying. Mm-hmm. And I think. It's not as good as the original, but I think it's the closest to the original we're ever going to Yeah, get. I thought so, too, when I saw that. I thought it was, it was pretty good. Um, I remember getting a real... I can't remember if it was now. Now I'm kind of... They were really close to one another, if I'm remembering correctly, too, because I'm kind of confusing them together now. I think the Texas Chainsaw remake was 2003. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I just remember I was traveling for work at the time. That sounds right. And I was like, oh, new Texas Chainsaw. I'm going to go watch people get ripped to shreds. I think I saw that one at the theater, actually. Yeah. When that came out. And then, of course, there was the one that came out after that. Texas Chainsaw 2. And then I The beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Which was like, we don't need a story for these people. Yeah. Not everything needs a background. I I remember... You know, hearing about it and and feeling the same way, and then I remember not really hearing anything good about it, so I never really thought to really see it's it. It's fair. It's yeah. fair at best. Yeah. And then we've had a couple other ones, and they just did this, uh, I think it's just called Leatherface, mm-hmm. that was out like a year ago, and it's just, it's a prequel to... Leatherface, mm-hmm. and it makes no sense. It has no connection to any of the original movies, mm-hmm. and it's fucking terrible. Mm-hmm. Literally terrible. These horror icons do not need a backstory. They just need to be scary. That's all that I, matters. I agree, and I mean, I, I understand the the like, you know, you, you want to know more about these characters because they're very mysterious and they're creepy, and you you start to like have a weird. Uh, fondness for them and you want to know more but it's almost like the mist the mystery is better i like what exists in the dark yeah that's, that's whatever is yeah. behind the curtain whatever is hiding in the darkness that i don't know about it's much more frightening to me than being like oh leatherface was abused by his parents and now he wants to cut skin off people's faces and eat them like i don't need to know that i know it, just it, kill it takes people. something away from it yeah it's yeah. not as scary anymore when when that happens. It's not as interesting when you know the truth. That's how I felt about those Maleficent. The, well, there's a new one coming out, but mm-hmm. the Maleficent movie. I. That's why I didn't like it, because I liked her being very evil and mysterious, and you know the mistress of all evil. And now I, you know, then they have the Malefic- Maleficent movie, and you find out like, well, she was scorned by the wizard and. Or she not was by this, the and she was I'm th- that. I'm, confu- I'm thinking about that Oz movie now, which was the same thing. Oh my, Oz the Great and Powerful. Yeah. <laughs> she was scorned by the king, uh, you know. So I, it's like. Wasn't James Franco Oz? Yeah, he in that was. Movie? Yeah, and I actually no, I, dude. I, 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 I like <laughs> no, just no. There's parts of that I like. I thought the scene where they're like. Uh, when he goes through the hurricane or the tornado was really cool. I liked the Sam Raimi elements of that movie, but everything else, same yeah. thing. You kind of take away from the wickedness, from the evilness, from the scariness. When you're telling me too much information, and you know, and I'm relating too much just to, you know, some abuse or horrible story that's like turning someone into an abuser. You know, I don't, well, I don't know. And that's the funny thing is, you know, I'm I'm the biggest Star Wars fan out there that you can get. Um, yes, I've, you are. 
I've been into Star Wars since I was three years old, 1977. That was the first movie I ever saw in a movie theater with my grandparents. Um, you know, we don't need all this. Yeah. It's, you know, I like the idea of what Disney Plus is doing with these TV shows and mm-hmm, whatnot. Mm-hmm. But the fact that everything needs to be so expanded on and we need a, a prequel to a prequel and then we need in between stories like Rogue One. I love the movie, mm-hmm. but some of this stuff, and I don't know if you guys agree with me or not, the few of you that are sitting here with us, but it gets to that point of we know this isn't about giving us more story. This isn't about giving us, you know, more truth or build up for the characters. It's really just about money. Yeah, I think Correct? so. Correct? I think so. They yeah. want. They just, like, want to try to, I guess, uh, pander and give people what they think they want and, you know, I, I you know. It's it's not that I I used to be a huge Star Wars fan myself and I kind of feel really pretty disillusioned by it you know I'm starting to feel that way yeah now yeah you know and I like honestly I liked that Solo movie mm-hmm. I thought it was totally fine I thought the guy that played Han Solo in the movie did the best job he could possibly do with the material he was given Rogue One I thought was probably the best of the newer Star Wars movies but we don't we just don't need all of it. Yeah. And it's getting to that point of oversaturation now that you're just starting to feel like, oh, God, more now? We yeah, don't always need more. I know. You're right. And it, it just it, it ruins something about it for me, I think. You know, I, I like that. You know, I like the mystery. I like and the to, mystique. I like to wonder things and and not really have the answer, not need the answer, you know. I mean, yeah. not everyone's like that. But it's, it's, I think that's the way I feel about it. Well, I mean, I think crowds in general are, um, you know, they're still paying to go see this stuff. So mm-hmm. they enjoy it so Yeah, and they're going to keep making them until people don't pay to see it. And, yeah. you know, the sad thing is about something that, that's really popular, that makes money, that people are going to want to go and, like, see opening weekend, is it doesn't matter if it's good or people like it. It just matters if it's making that money opening weekend yeah, and people go yeah. see it. And it can get a bunch of bad reviews and, you know, the, the audiences could just pan it. But it, if you went and saw it and you paid the money, they're going to make another one. I think a lot that plays into this, too, is like what we saw happen with Spider-Man this week. Mm-hmm. Basically, you know, it hit the Internet that Disney was demanding a 50 percent stake in any future Spider-Man movies. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of rumor going around that, well, you know, now Sony is going to reboot Spider-Man. Yeah. A fourth time. Like, no, I don't, I don't need that. Just leave Spider-Man alone for a little while. Get the deal worked out. In the meantime, and now it's come out that Disney said, we want a 30% stake, which is a huge difference when you're talking about movies that are making a billion dollars profit. Yeah. You know, that's a huge sum of money. It's a huge difference. So now it's all changed. Now they're saying they're working it out, but it all plays into that same thing. Like how many Spider-Man movies do we need? How many Marvel movies do we need? That guy, Tim from the peanut butter Falcon Mm -hmm. that we talked about earlier, he brought that up a lot in the conversation. Yeah. He's trying to get a movie made about, a 32-year-old man that has Down syndrome. He took it to Amazon. He took it to Netflix. He took it to a bunch of the big studios, and none of them were interested. And it's like that's that's a bummer because it's like that's something that I think we need because there's not enough of that. Yeah. And it's like people, some people, some audiences, I think want variety and want to see I something do. that you don't see every day. Yeah. It's like there are down people with Down syndrome. All over the place. Why isn't why isn't there a movie about someone with Down syndrome? Well, he said, you know, in the meetings, all these people w- were concerned about is profit, and are people going to pay to see it? Which I understand. If you're going to put money yeah. into something, you want people to buy tickets. Mm-hmm. Myself, I want to see something different. I would pay. Luckily, I don't have to pay to see most of this stuff now. Yeah. But you know, a movie about a 32 year old man that has Down syndrome that escapes from a retirement community in his underpants and meets up with a homeless crab fisherman played by Shia LaBeouf 
and they go on a road trip via boat, via beach, via water, via forest. I mean, these guys are all over the place in this movie. And basically, the movie is about this 32-year-old man with Down syndrome trying to find his hero, which is a pro wrestler named the Saltwater, the Saltwater Redneck. <laughs> This guy, he wants to become a, this Down syndrome guy wants to become a pro wrestler. And his hero used to run a wrestling school mm -hmm. down south. So he's like, I want to find this guy. Escapes this community. It's really interesting. That's it's. A, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, that's a really unique plot. And it's like, I know I haven't, I know I haven't seen that movie. You tell me the Spider-Man plot, I've seen that movie. Yeah, because it's always you know? big bad villain, yeah. you know with technology that's going to kick everybody's ass. Mm -hmm. so, so let them figure out that Spider-Man stuff. There's other, I mean, even within the Marvel Universe, there's a lot more things they can do. Which, well, they just announced Moon Knight, Ms. Marvel, and She-Hulk, which I'm very excited I about. I know, you've been wanting that for a while. I have, and it's a TV show. I can't wait to see what they're going <laughs> to do. I can't wait. I think moving into the TV realm with that stuff is a really smart idea, too, because you have option for actual character development. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's in a movie, you've got 90 to 120 minutes. Yeah. Maybe two and a half hours with some of them now. Um, I mean, Endgame long, was almost right? three hours. Yeah. What was the other one that was just out that was really, really long? There was another one. What, a, a comic Another book comic book movie that was like super long. I don't know. No, it's not, I'm thinking about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That was really oh, long. Oh, yeah, that was a long one. <laughs> Have you guys They're seen that movie long. yet? Anybody? They're all long. Are you guys all fans of Tarantino or no? Go see it if you like Tarantino. Yeah. We just did a full yeah. episode on... We did a 90-minute episode like two weeks ago mm -hmm. just on that movie. There's still more things I could say about that movie yeah. too after all that. If you're a fan of film, which I imagine you guys probably are because you're here today, mm -hmm. it's a love letter to... Hollywood in the 60s. Yeah. It's not a typical Tarantino film. There's not a lot of swearing. No, I mean, they, they drop some F-bombs, but it's not like what you're used to. And it's definitely not really as chock full of violence as the other ones, too. There's no violence for you in there. Yeah, but it's It doesn't like, lay you down on it, but... Yeah. Very, very limited. Yeah. Very, very limited violence. But yeah, if you like Tarantino's dialogue... It's a must see. Mm -hmm. If you're a fan of old school films, old school westerns, yeah, that was some of the best stuff in the movie. I thought. I thought so too. Was him working on the western and that little girl? Yeah, I think I said it on the show. I think too. I want to see like a whole episode of, of just whatever that I can't remember the name yeah. of the show that he was on, but I want to see a whole episode of that. I just want to see them. I want to see Tarantino do a western with Leo now. Hell you yeah. know, yeah, <laughs> I love that. Because he was so good in that movie, he will get an Oscar. You think so? Yeah, yeah. I hope he does. And I think Tarantino is probably going to get Best Picture. He deserves it. it. I mean, they deserve it. That was a good. Yeah. Thing. I mean, I know it's. A, I think it's a pretty divisive film, but I really liked it. I think all his films are divisive, though. Yeah. You know, what's I, crazy is my son. You know, he's 16, and he got introduced to Tarantino by a friend five or six months ago, mm -hmm. and he's just been slowly making his way through the catalog. So that was the age I got into him, too. It's a yeah. good age to... That's what I... When I first watched Reservoir Dogs, it was about that age, and I... Like, yeah, I think I was 18 when that came out. I watched that movie on a repeat over and over and over again. And yeah. I don't do that with many movies, but um, I know that movie probably by heart. I just, once it would end, I would just, it was tape. It would just rewind and start back over, and I obsessively watched that one. Obsessively. Well, my son came downstairs and said, Dad, I just watched Reservoir Dogs. And instantly I went, you cut my fucking ear off. <laughs> and he just started cracking up, and my wife is like, would you shut up? Like, what are you doing? He's your son. I'm like, these are the things that fathers and sons share together. I yeah. learned this from my dad. That's, well, that's, you know? that's how me and my dad were, too. It's yeah. like, he's, he's the one who'd be, who was like... You know, okay, I really think... He's like, I don't want to watch it with you, but I think you'd really like the movie Pink Flamingos. And I was like, okay. And that's and one I of your watched, favorites now. Yeah, and I watched it around that age, too. And I'm like, I can't believe my dad recommended this movie <laughs> to me. 
It's amazing though, because dads, you know, they have very, a lot of times they have really good taste. Yeah. You know, and it's just funny because he's like, I don't want to watch it with you, but I think you should watch it. <laughs> yeah, because there's some. <laughs> stuff in there I would not be comfortable watching yeah. with my dad either. <laughs> he said that to me about a few movies too. He's like, I'm not going to watch it with you, but you should definitely yeah. watch this one. Yeah, the other one watch that we your friends. that we really got into together, me and my dad, were the Aliens movies. Yeah. Again, we didn't see the first one because I was too young, mm-hmm. but he introduced it to me probably when I was seven or eight. Yeah. And then it was when Aliens came out in the theater, like, I was all about it. Yeah. You know? And then, of course, we saw... Alien 3 together, which people hate that movie. I don't like that one that much. I think that's kind of a... I mean, I, I don't think I've seen any past that, to be honest. It's different. It's definitely different. I love that movie. Yeah. I actually adore that movie just because it's David Fincher, mm-hmm. and you can feel his mark all over it. Yeah. And the whole, we have no weapons. Mm-hmm. We have no weapons. We are fighting the worst <laughs> bleeding acid creature in the galaxy, and we have no way to fight it other than our brain. Mm -hmm. So that's why I liked it. Yeah. You know, the thing I don't like about that movie is the fact that you get the plight of aliens of Newt and Ripley trying to survive on LV-426. They escape, you know, and then you find out Alien 3 at the very beginning, everybody on the escape shuttle died. Yeah. I feel like, why'd you put me through all that? Exactly. If they're just going to die. Yeah. That yeah. was my major problem. With yeah, that. that's something me and Mike talked about a lot about that movie. It's like, why, why bother? You know, it's like you, you, you gave a. It's a little bit of a letdown, I think. Like what you know, it kind of erases everything from the second movie. You know, and some of the CGI, because that was kind of, kind of towards the beginning of all the CGI stuff. Some of the CGI, like when they're in the water, yeah. is pretty terrible. No, that's a movie that's been a minute since I've seen, but I know I did not enjoy when I watched because I really liked. Alien and Aliens, so I yeah. was like super pumped for three. And I saw them, I saw, I saw them later, you know, yeah. in life. I didn't see them when they were new, and I didn't even see them like in the '90s or anything. So, did you see Alien Resurrection or no? no? I haven't. Oh. I never watched anything past three because I kind of, I kind of got a little, I guess, disappointed at that point. You know, Alien Resurrection is basically. That's the like, one with Renona Ryder. It's the right? one with Renona yeah. Ryder, and it's basically like a dark horse comic transposed to the screen and the humor's terrible the special effects are, are terrible mm-hmm. but it's got uh what's his face chucky oh brad Dourif. brad Dourif plays like this crazy ass doctor that's experimenting on the xenos that and makes it, you want to watch it yeah because he's him. like totally yeah. a freak in this movie my precious precious baby ball yeah he's got a he, good, he's got a good yeah. voice for yeah. that <laughs> um other than that that movie's terrible and then of course we got prometheus no, I liked that. I saw that in the theater. I like Prometheus. I really, really liked that one, and I, w- I wanted to watch it again, and I haven't had a, a chance to. It's one of the best-looking 3D Blu-rays out there. Yeah. Yeah, like the environmental shots are absolutely astounding. The clarity on the picture is phenomenal. The audio is great. You know, there's some stumbling blocks in that story as well, mm-hmm. but then there's Covenant, which... You didn't like it? Oh, God. No. See, I've heard... Both. I've heard it's amazing, yeah. and then I heard it's horrible, and I that it's like if I don't if I'm excited about a movie when it comes to theater and I don't get to the theater for whatever reason, I feel like it's like at least five years before I can see it. Yeah. I don't. It's just I don't know why. Well, you know I've got everything so, on Blu-ray, so well, you I'm can always like come over your, and raid my collection. Yeah, you know? I will. I think next time I'm there. <laughs> yeah, Covenant is. Has anybody here seen Covenant? No. Yes. Yeah, some. Is it them. is bad to you as it is to me? You liked it. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard people really dig it, and then some people have your opinion. Yeah. So I'm like, makes me want to see it even more because I'm like. And that's one thing about me. A lot of people get really shitty. Like you see all this stuff online on Facebook. Like it's the worst ever. It's the best ever. It's this. It's that. You know, and all this hatred that gets spewed. This fanboy shit. It's got to stop. <laughs> I mean, I see people literally wanting to kill each other over what's supposed to be entertainment. Opinions. Too. Opinion. Yeah. Like. This isn't life or death. Like, either yeah. you like it or you don't. My thing is, when somebody enjoys a movie that I don't, I'm like, more power to you. I'm glad that somebody saw quality in that motion picture yeah. that I didn't see, that yeah. I didn't enjoy. Because right. it means there's something there. 
Yeah, yeah They're I'm still the same fun. way. Well, I just, you know, the thing about me is I really, really like movies, and I even will enjoy an experience of watching a movie if I don't like it, because then I know I didn't like it. Right. And then when I meet someone who liked it, I'm kind of like, wow, okay, cool. What did you like about it? Let me see it through your eyes now. Yeah. You Give, know? Let me know what you liked about it. Yeah, and that makes total sense. Yeah, and I might still think you're nuts for liking it, but, you know, <laughs> I'm curious to, to know. You We've know? had those conversations before. Of course. Yeah. So, anyways, we didn't introduce ourselves at all. I know there's not a lot of you in here. We're in the back room today. <laughs> um, our podcast is Real Crime. It's based off a website. I started the moviesleuth.com. I started it about nine years ago. Um, there was this huge boom in TV happening then. Um, with Breaking Bad shows like that and Facebook and Twitter and you know Instagram and all those things were starting to really kick off and at the time there was everybody complaining about spoilers stop posting spoilers stop posting spoilers so I wanted to start a movie blog slash review site at the time and there were no sites out then that were spoiler free so when I launched the movie sleuth the initial name was spoiler free movie sleuth and we've still maintained that to this day. Mm -hmm. We were the first spoiler-free website ever. Um, and all of our reviews are still strictly spoiler-free. They're all 400 words or more, most of our reviews, but we don't give away any plot details. Everything is based on judgment and critical response to the film. We, don't, we might tell you a little bit like, oh, this movie is about this, but we don't ever put anything in our reviews that is going to spoil that product for mm -hmm. you when you see it. So off of that, we kind of spawned Real Crime, our podcast. So just a little bit of history. If you guys want cards, there's some stuff down here. It's got the QR code on it if you guys want to bring it up on your phone or whatnot. So typically we do a weekly podcast when life allows for it. Yes. But sometimes it's hard when you're adults and you have kids and jobs and all that. Yes. As we can all understand. Jobs, yeah. Yeah. So we got a few minutes left. What else do you want to talk about? Um, well, I want to talk a little bit about what we saw so far today. Oh yeah. Um, I, we didn't get to see a lot of the films, but on um, the one that I, the one that I actually saw the full of the, it was called. Um, oh no, I can't remember what it was called because I was drinking. Was it You Killed Us? Yeah, that one? You Killed okay, Us. I that, did not see it. That was really cool. Um, it was a, like a ten-minute short, super eerie, moody, creepy basement type stuff a lot of gore not really sure exactly what happened in it other than it was in a creepy basement and there was gore but you know for an eight minute ten minute movie that's all you need it yeah, looked yeah. really freaking cool and then i don't know the name of the one that we saw before <laughs> but it was a very i would call it a feel bad movie yeah it was pretty rough <laughs> yeah probably. we enjoyed it yeah there is uh, something in there for everyone to feel a little uncomfortable about. So, I mean, it, it fits the trauma. It really fit, like, there what I think of. There was a lot of semen. Yes. And penises. Yes. And boobs. Yes. And yeah, it was pretty... Uh, and I don't want to say vile because, you know, like, we watch this stuff anyways. Yeah. But it is kind of vile. Yeah, it made, very, it made light of some, uh, you know, a few different types of sexual assault. Yeah. You know? <laughs> So it was. It was definitely, you know, it, it puts you in. It puts you in a good mind space to be here at Trauma Dance, you know. Yeah. So I enjoyed it for what it was. It made me laugh. I wish I knew the name of it. Um, we'll find it out. We'll link yeah. it in the episode when we post it. Yeah. Um, some. I saw some really cool art out in the lobby too from different artists that were are. Um, selling their, their yeah. art. There's a lot of Blu-rays here, DVD stuff for sale. Different filmmakers. So. Um, there's going to be some uh, burlesque performers later tonight. I think more music. Yeah. The, well, we saw the band Spaceman, which <laughs> I was really digging, honestly. I took a, I took a few videos of that. Yeah, I got some that, photos of that, too. And I want to I check them out later. Um, they had a very cool stage show with everyone had different masks on and just uh, I think she said they were sunra inspired, so they're experimental, like noise with a beat, and is if you like just weird. It just sounded stuff. like experimental jazz to yeah, me. Yeah, if you like kinda... weird stuff, definitely recommend it. And I think everybody here likes weird stuff, correct? <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, yeah, definitely a lot of cool stuff here. Yeah. I'm happy that we came. I'm definitely going to want to come back next year and, you know, see more variety of things. I, you know, it's really cool that it's, you know, we got a film fest, but we have all this other type of art, different podcasts to check out, music. Really cool. Well, so I was talking to the manager here, and he said we can use the space to do our own film festival if we'd like. Oh, yeah, you were mentioning that. Which is something we wanted to do for a while. Um, We make very little money. We basically just pay pay the bills, you know. Um, Nobody really gets paid to write for us. It's more of a, you know, out of the love of film thing. Um, But Jason Trost that did the FP2, mm-hmm. he wants us to do a screening for him. Oh, that's so be that awesome. would be part of that, and he said he would come here for it. Oh. Have any of you guys ever seen the FP? Have you guys ever heard of this movie? It's so fun. If you're really into like cult film, low budget stuff, you gotta check out the FP. It's basically a post-apocalyptic movie, but nothing in the film is post-apocalyptic. Everything looks very suburban, nothing's destroyed, but basically, you have to go and play Dance Dance Revolution to survive in this world. <laughs> and it's called Dance Dance Revelation in the movie. And if you lose, you die. You know, when you're competing, you die. And he just made a sequel, the FP2, Beats of Rage, which was completely self-funded. It looks great, sounds yeah. great. It's if you like humor and you like underground stuff, you guys have got to check these movies out. It's super out. funny. They're, it's super stylistic. Like, the way that it looks is, like, beautiful, even though it's so silly. And um, everyone's costumes are very elaborate. It's <laughs> the way they talk. They have, like, their own, like, language almost. It's it's really fun. What's a world without ducks, it, J-Tro? And it's yeah. almost like, it, when I was watching it, it almost kind of reminded me of like a, the way that he set up that whole universe and all the, the world and the language and everything almost reminded me of like a John Waters movie. Oh, for sure. Like, yeah. it was just its own universe. It was so cool. I hope that guy makes more movies. Yeah, so his name's Jason Trost. He self-funds everything himself. He makes all the movies himself. He does like some GoFundMe stuff to raise money for his projects. But his brother... His, his brother's Brandon Trost, who is a director of photography on like almost every major movie you see coming out of Hollywood now. His oh, brother is like huge DP. So, um, yeah, very successful family. Jason's sister is also in film, too. Oh, cool. So, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, I think we're basically done for today. Yeah. Yeah. Hope you guys find us on Facebook at The Movie Sleuth. Also find us at realcrime.podbean.com. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Live and yeah. whoever is, you know, going to yeah. listen to us later. Yep. Cool. Thanks, guys. Good night. Visit us at www.themoviesleuth.com and find The Movie Sleuth on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and iTunes.